So let me start by, by welcoming um, everybody. Thanks a lot for joining for this webinar today, which we entitled Challenges and Opportunities for Forest-Based Industries Engagement in Ecosystem Restoration. My name is Sven Walter. I'm the Senior Forestry Officer at FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and I'm the Secretary of FAO's Advisory Committee on Sustainable-Based Industries, the so-called ACSFI. Last Saturday or last weekend, we celebrated the International Day of Forest under the theme Forest Restoration, a path to recovery and well-being. And you may have attended the celebrations organized by FAO, by the UNFF, and by many other partners. So today we somehow continue these celebrations from the last weekend by looking into the contributions of the private sector to ecosystem restoration. And more precisely to the contribution of the private sector to the decade on ecosystem restoration. And it's a great pleasure and indeed an honor for us and for me to invite and to, uh, to see all these recognized speakers we have today for the event and the representatives from the two UN leading agencies on who are steering the decade, namely UNEP and, and FAO. Before leaving the floor to all our panelists, let me just share with you some housekeeping messages and just start quickly introducing who are the hosts of this event today. We have on the one side, the ACSFI. Again, it's the Advisory Committee on Sustainable Forest-Based Industry of FAO. It consists of some 20 leading private sector experts representing forest products, forest industry, and pulp and paper associations from all around the world. They provide guidance to us, to FAO, on concepts, approaches, and initiatives in the field of sustainable production and consumption of forest products. And the ACSFI members and their members bring together some 2,000 organizations millions of employees, highlighting the relevance of the forest business to contribute to green growth, green recovery to address the COVID pandemic, livelihoods, but also ecosystem restoration. And the committee just recently adopted its strategic framework for the next 10 years and ecosystem restoration as one cornerstone of their work. On the other side, we have the Forest Technical Network, and that includes FAO colleagues from headquarters, the sub-regional offices, and from the country offices who are all interested in forest-related issues. And so it's great to bring you know, these people together, and I would really like to welcome warmly everybody, FAO colleagues, ACSFI members and their members, and all other colleagues who joined today. Let me just tell you that we will record the event and that the report, the recording and all the presentations will be uploaded on the website of the ACSFI and you will get the link um, in the chat function. We will use the webinar function of Zoom. So please use either the Q&A or the chat function to ask questions or to make comments. Having said this and giving a little bit of frame, let's move to the real opening and the welcome. And it's a great pleasure to have with us um, Mette, Mette Wilke, who is the director of FAO's forestry uh, division. She has more than 30 years of experience providing scientific evidence, policy advice, government partners, international conventions. Most of you know her very well. And it's great to have you with us, uh, Mette. And yeah, I give you the floor to set the scene and provide the framework about this topic of private sector engagement and ecosystem restoration. Meta, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Sven, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you're joining from. And a very warm welcome to this webinar from a very cold Rome. Uh, temperatures came down below zero last night. But very pleased to be here with you and to take this opportunity to look at what are these challenges and opportunities for the private sector to engage in ecosystem restoration. As Sven mentioned, this is organized by the Advisory Committee on Sustainable Forest-Based Industries and the FAO Forest Technical Network. 
As he also mentioned, 2021 is the first year of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which FAO, together with our sister organizations, United Nations Environment Program, are leading the implementation of. And that's so important because we know that we have more than 2 billion hectares of degraded forest and land worldwide. And that we're losing more than 10% of GDP in lost ecosystem services due to that degradation. So the need for ecosystem restoration is pressing, but we can only do that if we work together. We want all stakeholders to be involved, all people from age three to 103 to be involved in ecosystem restoration. And the private sector with its capacity to raise capital, develop innovative financing instruments, its access to a wide range of skills and its vast area of land that it has under management is a crucial partner and stakeholder in the long-term restoration, conservation, sustainable use of our natural resources. In recognition of this important role that the private sector plays in not just forestry, but also in agriculture and fisheries, FAO has recently endorsed a new strategy for private sector engagement. And we're very pleased that the ACSFI have actually contributed to that. And when we talk about the private sector, we talk about everyone from the individuals and small scale, medium scale enterprises to large firms and multinational companies. All of those are important stakeholders as we work to realize both the goals of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, but more broadly, of course, the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda. So I'd like to congratulate ACSFI for their new strategy and, of course, in particular, for the decision to include ecosystem restoration as one of the priority areas of interest. I think this will help benefit FAO through the insights and the advice that you'll be providing to us. It will benefit the members of the ACSFI, the forest-based industries themselves, but most importantly, it will help the forest ecosystems around the world and the people who depend on them. So I would very strongly invite all the forest-based industries and all of those listening in here today to join the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, to be part of the generation restoration and to help make that vision that we have for 2030 of a place where we are in balance with nature, where we have more areas under restoration and fewer areas being degraded, a, a real solution. We know that we can do this. We know that if we do it right, we can help restore the economy. We can help combat climate change and we can help reduce the loss of biodiversity. So I hope that we will hear a good examples today, particularly of the opportunities and how we overcome the challenges that might be to engage the private sector in ecosystem restoration. And I wish you a very fruitful discussion. I'd now like to hand over to the moderator of this event, Mr. Jose Carlos de Fonseca Jr., who is the executive director of the Brazilian tree industry and the incoming vice chair of the ACSFI. Jose Carlos, over to you. Thank you very much, Mette. Good morning, you all. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here today representing uh, IBA, the Brazilian tree industry. I thank uh, Sven Walter and the whole ACSFI team and congratulate FAO itself on a very, on a job well done. Uh, we have a terrible, terrific uh, lineup of speakers today. And so I'll be very short. Uh, the Brazilian tree industry represents the whole production chain uh, of planted uh, forest, uh, up to the forest and to the, in the different segments of our industry in Brazil. Uh, we generate uh, millions of jobs. We change lives in, in different places around Brazil, places that were previously uh, 
low in economic dynamism, places that were uh, de degraded. And uh, so we are very happy to, to contribute with our own experience, or our own perspective to the ACSFI. Uh, the choice of uh, engaging very strongly on this uh, amazing initiative of the UN Decade on ec Ecosystem Restoration is a very strategic one. And of course, we cannot uh, start any activity these days without uh, remembering uh, the moment we are undergoing the whole world. Just to give you an idea, yesterday in Brazil, uh, we had terrible figures of uh, deaths uh, for one single period of 24 hours. Over 3,000 people lost their lives. So uh, the pandemic is teaching us very painful lessons. And of course, what we do here today, what we discuss here today, what we get engaged in, uh, in such initiatives as the Decade of Restoration uh, is all part of a single moment where we realize that we are all uh, members of, a, of the same species, uh, uh, riders in the same boat, uh, and we need to preserve and to uh, save our planet. So this is an amazing opportunity for us to discuss this as we uh, look ahead and see the end of this terrible crisis we are still undergoing. So without much uh, delay, uh, in order to get started with our great discussion today, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Ludwig Liegre. Uh, Ludwig is an international consultant, and he will be our first panelist and a specialist in sustainable land use finance. Between 2009 and 2014, Ludwig operated as forest policy and finance advisor for the German Development Corporation, GIZ, in Middle East, North Africa, and Latin America. Later, Ludwig worked uh, with UN agencies and DFI, such as UNDP, FAO, UNCCD, and EID. He holds a master's degree in agriculture science, environmental economics from Agro Paris Tech, France, and an MBA from Le Collège des Ingenieurs, uh, France, Germany. He is currently enrolled as PhD candidate on national forest and funds, forest funds at the University of Padova, Italy. So uh, Ludwig, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Jose Carlos, for, for this introduction. Uh, hello, dear colleagues. That's a fantastic pleasure to be with you today. Uh, to be able to share some food for thought on the work we are currently doing on the challenges and opportunities for forest-based industries engagement in ecosystem restoration. As you will see, there are already a lot going on from the forest-based industries and probably a need to publicize more, but that's of course gonna be part of our discussion. Maybe as a reminder to start with, what is ecosystem restoration? Ecosystem restoration is several things. In fact, it means assisting in the recovery of ecosystems that have been degraded or destroyed, but it also means conserving these ecosystems that are still intact. It uh, addresses a diversity of natural ecosystems, including forests, of course, but also freshwater, mountains, peatlands, oceans and coasts, among others. In fact, other types of ecosystems that all have a connection to forests and uh, benefit from forest goods and services. And very importantly, we are entering the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, as Meta reminded us, and that we will uh, discuss more in the following of this event as a very important framework, potentially where in which the forest-based industries could engage further. A bit of context and rationale on our work. Um, the forest-based industries globally, they create millions of jobs. So very important uh, sector for employment creation. If you look at the management under the supervision of business entities in terms of forest areas, we've got a more, than 20, uh, uh, more than 420 million hectares that are directly managed by business entities. So it's more or less 10% of the global forest areas. So you see a massive impact of the forest-based industries but when we look at how these forest-based companies are now engaging in ecosystem restoration declaration or commitments, we observe that almost none of them, or very few of them, surprisingly, 
are committing or signing any uh, declaration of that sort. So that's really a question mark. Why is that so? And oh, maybe that could be changed in the near future. And so our background paper really seeks to uncover the possible roles that the forest-based industries could play for ecosystem restoration from the operational point of view, but also from the financial side. And today, I'm going to present you a few results about how the financing options are already uh, an important driver from the forest-based industries for ecosystem restoration. I'm just looking, I'm just showing you now a few of the case studies that we've been looking at. So it's not exhaustive, but it shows you that we've looked at case studies from all continents um, with very interesting companies. And I, I won't say much because many of those, several of those will be uh, our distinguished panelists later on in the program. Something we observe is that the forest-based industries are quite key to public goods generation. First, because many of them adopt already the so-called mosaic restoration approach that combines production with conservation and restoration. And we have to, to recognize that in some cases, if these approaches were not conducted, then probably there would not be any forests anymore because of all the pressures, livestock, grazing, and so on. Many of these companies also start to look at ecosystem services valuation and valorization, which at the end enhance uh, the provision of ecosystem services at the benefit of our societies. And finally, many already embed sustainability in their value chains, all along the value chains, uh, including, including the small holders. Um, and so that's also part of sustainability, of course, and public goods generation, that part on value chains that uh, ultimately contributes also to create a number of jobs as we already so before in the figures. Some uh, elements of rationale for forest-based industries engagement in ecosystem restoration. They are really clear, um, uh, already a clear rationale and, and very important aspects of a virtuous circle for why these companies engage in ecosystem restoration. And the benefits are in terms of boosting the supply of forest products because forests become more healthy, more resilient but also increasing products value through sustainable certifications, mitigating risks. We're going to see that a bit later, but also diversifying income stream, building on the variety of forest goods and services, promoting sustainability in value chains. We saw it, but also strategically mobilizing sustainable finance. And we're going to see examples today in the panel of companies who already use this virtual circle and mobilize sustainable finance partly for ecosystem restoration. So at the end of the day, it's a kind of uh, investor rationale underlying the engagement of forest-based industries in ecosystem restoration, at least for those which are already engaged in ecosystem restoration. There, there is a clear balance, of course, between the returns and benefits one side around all the forest goods and services, but also on the avoided risks and costs on the other side, which really builds an interesting investor uh, risks and return, uh, risk and returns rational underlying engagement of forest-based industries. Also, we observe this diversity in terms of financing solutions that are already implemented and developed by forest-based industries to engage in ecosystem restoration. One of the tools that is quite commonly used um, is green bonds. And we're going to have a great example with Clabin today uh, on how green bonds proceeds can be used for ecosystem conservation and restoration. We also observe payments for ecosystem services are quite critical. The company uh, Global Campbell, for example, in Arizona, is already using some payments from water utilities to co-finance plantations in return, in recognition of the water services provided by the plantations. Similarly, we've got great examples of impact funds and blended finance models. Uh, we, we will have also a good example today with new forests and the tropical Asian forestry facility. But there are also other models like the landscape fund by the company Aroco in, uh, in Chile. So many uh, innovations on that front that all contribute to ecosystem restoration. So some of the key messages uh, we'd like to share today is that the forest-based industries, they clearly do a lot, uh, at least the pioneers, because of course, we can't, uh, for the time being, draw two quick conclusions. 
uh, and that will be important also to look at the whole sector, the whole value chain, and to embark possibly the companies that are less advanced uh, to adopt some of the good practices of the companies more advanced. But we observe still there is a lot going on in terms of operations and in terms of innovative financing. I've talked already about some of the multiple options that have been used uh, and that are developed by forest-based industries for ecosystem restoration. But clearly we see the need to move forward with mainstreaming of good practices in the industry and share the lessons learned on what works, what doesn't work, both on the operational side and on the financing side. Of course, building the investor rational towards maybe the less convinced companies may be important to catalyze commitments and engagement for ecosystem restoration. And we could again ask the question, why not joining more proactively restoration alliances and initiatives that could benefit, of course, forest-based industries, but as we saw, forest-based industries in return could really benefit ecosystem restoration and our societies. So some elements now on the way forward. What could, what could we do next? What could the forest-based industries maybe engage in or do next, including with the support of technical partners like FAO? Um, one aspect could be about reinforcing partnerships. We, we have met and, and we know there are strong partnerships existing that uh, may deserve to be reinforced, uh, aggregate more partners, such as the SACFI, the ACSFI itself, but also the World Economic Forum Tropical Forest Alliance, the new generation plantation platform, or the WBCSD Forest Solutions Group. One maybe idea to discuss is to create a new forest-based industries working group on sustainable finance for ecosystem restoration and restoration-friendly forest products. That may be something relevant, either attached to one of the existing partnerships or maybe another group to be created, um, if that makes sense. Uh, but it seems to us that something that is a little bit lacking at the time being, so would be really happy to have your views and ideas about what could be done further uh, on Dutch and ID. Also, we observe there are a lot of initiatives going on on the economics of ecosystems, um, and it may be relevant to continue supporting valuation and valorization of ecosystem services uh, through the work of forest-based industries and potentially taking stock of the most recent developments on the uh, UN sustainability accounting frameworks on uh, the economics of ecosystem restoration that some of our colleagues are working on currently that could really benefit forest-based industries to better analyze what ecosystem services they produce and further down the road to valorize them. Of course, uh, we saw the importance of the value chains in the forest-based industries, including the smallholders engagement, and we would recommend more work to be done, including smallholders in, in the near future. And we are gonna have today a great model called Maza that shows us how to engage with smallholders, uh, which could maybe uh, be also one of the way forward for some of the forest-based industries. Of course, developing guidelines on good practices for ecosystem restoration financing involving uh, forest-based industries could be important as well as leveraging all the technical expertise on forest finance that FAO and other partners here today in the room with us have that could be provided to forest-based industries, but also government and other business partners to make ecosystem restoration really happen on the ground. And with that, um, I'd like to thank you and I wish us really a good discussion today. Jose Carlos, back to you. Thank you so much, Ludwig. Uh, great presentation, very promising uh, aspects. I don't know if you see me, I don't see me, yes. And, uh, and uh, amazing when you mentioned this uh, mosaic approach that uh, is one of the highlights of our sector in Brazil and in many other countries where we combine production and conservation with restoration. This is uh, an amazing development. Uh, also, some very interesting uh, remarks on inno innovative uh, economic financial instruments that are very promising, as we'll see uh, 
as we proceed with the webinar and uh, all the potential for positive impact funds that we, we have. So uh, with uh, having said that, it is my privilege now to introduce a fellow Brazilian, my friend Francisco Razzolini, who is the executive uh, director of Clabin, uh, a, a Brazilian company of which we are very proud. Uh, Razzolini is a chemical engineer, uh, graduated from Federal University of Paraná in Brazil, a master in paper engineering from Universidad Politécnica de Catalunya in Spain. He has joined the club in 36 years ago, working on several areas as pulp and paper production engineer, corporate planning, economical studies, M&A, joint ventures, project development and implementation, procurement and purchasing. COO of pulp business. He has been leading uh, Clubin's major project expansions in the last 15 years, and is also Clubin's CTO, leading R&D, automation, technology, innovation, and sustainability. Uh, my friend Francisco, you have the floor now. Thank you, Jose Carlos. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, maybe good evening for all the attendees that are here. Uh, it's uh, an honor to, to be with uh, to be with you today, and I'll try to share some of uh, uh, of the things Clabin has been doing, especially in ecosystem restoration and involvement of the small landowners that uh, are uh, key suppliers to our uh, system uh, today. So uh, Clabin uh, is a Brazilian company. Uh, we are some present in Brazil. Uh, we are located in, in southern part of Brazil uh, where we grow our, our forests. And today we will speak uh, uh, briefly about the uh, mosaic planting patterns, uh, forest restoration uh, at our supply chain, wood supply chain, our green and sustainability linker bonds, and also some uh, views from uh, why, uh, how FAO and private sector can engage to this uh, system. Uh, Clabin is a, a, a centenary company in Brazil, uh, quite unique from our standards here in, in, in this part of the world, 121 years uh, making history here in Brazil. Uh, we manage today our, almost uh, 500,000 uh, hectares of uh, land and that's including uh, almost uh, 256,000 hectares of planted uh, pine and eucalyptus forest. This is converted today in about three and a half million tons of fibers and also uh, converting great part of that. Some we integrate into uh, almost two million tons of paper and we do also supply uh, pulp to the market. Clubbing is integrated from forest to uh, paper products. One uh, important thing about uh, clubbing and our forest management system is that uh, there is a very big part of our forest that is are preserved. So more than 40% today of our forest lands are preserved. And um, uh, uh, in a, it's our main uh, land, let's say, uh, we adopted uh, since the beginning the mosaic uh, management, forest management system, the mosaic handling. And uh, this is uh, quite unique and uh, it forms a very interesting ecological corridors uh, that preserves a lot the biodiversity, the fauna, the flora, and the river springs. So that uh, helps us a lot enhancing production and uh, also increasing the biodiversity. So uh, due to our forest management model, Clabin was the first company in the poop and paper industry in the Southern Hemisphere to receive the FSC certification. And this was back to 1998, uh, our first certification. We've been uh, renewing and expanding this since that. So what are these uh, mosaic planting patterns? Uh, well, uh, these are, uh, let's say, uh, smaller planting fields intermingle with the native vegetation. 
This uh, brings us high environmental quality forests, uh, ecological corridors to promote uh, the population, the uh, wildlife population dynamics, and also uh, fosters a lot of our forest productivity. And uh, uh, for us, this is clearly true now that uh, this um, high forest productivity that we are reaching in our part uh, of, uh, of Brazil in our plantations, and, and it's quite high today, we are something like 25% above the average of the Brazilian industry that's quite high compared to other places in the world, that uh, this uh, uh, sustainable uh, uh, and complex environmental that we develop there is, is helping a lot, uh, helping that the productivity uh, keeps uh, very high. Uh, and maintain the ecosystem quality and also uh, improving then restoration and, and preservation. And uh, also uh, today looking into this uh, economical services. Oh, our, another topic is the forest restoration in our uh, forest chain. We've been uh, fostering a lot of uh, plantations uh, with our uh, neighbors, uh, with uh, small, medium-sized landowners, aiming to diversify their properties, economical activities, and also then uh, fostering a, a big chain. So we have this uh, strengthening this uh, ties with the, our wood partners, wood supply partners, uh, in order to provide a positive impact on the, on the landscape increasing then conservation and productivity. And uh, our uh, multitask holder approach to that restoration model uh, led to already 21,000 hectares restored uh, and preserved in, in, in this partners producers uh, areas. It's more than 1,700 uh, uh, properties that were already impacted. And we do, we do have two a special programs in the company that in Portuguese uh, is called Matas Legais and Matas Sociais. Uh, these uh, programs provide technical support in native forest seedings to support the development and conservation of, of the areas there. Uh, matas means this uh, uh, native forest uh, or bush and uh, legais means legal mostly, but uh, legais here in Brazil too means uh, something that is very nice, very good or cool. And uh, Mata Sociais is a program much more to diversify the production of the is, is small forest holders, small landowners to diversify and then also to develop uh, uh, organic uh, agriculture that's today we are also closing this uh, loop in a circularity way, approaching these uh, producers also to the consumers in, in the, the market in the regions, including supplying clubbing with uh, uh, the, their production. So uh, another interesting topic that we are, could develop was the financing of all this uh, ecosystem uh, restoration developments and also all the uh, green bonds and sustainability bonds that we're able to launch that are supporting also the development of the other activities in the company. So uh, today uh, uh, we launched uh, two green bonds on 2017, another one in 2019, and most recently now a sustainability linked bond. Uh, this is uh, giving finance and most uh, today we are using to develop our forest management system, sustainable forest management system. But you see that part of that is already being used for forest conservation and restoration. So almost $12 million in, in native forest restoration and conservation has already been used. And we are uh, say using this capital market instrument to support uh, the reversing of uh, biodiversity laws and reinforcing our natural forest quality uh, through the ecosystem uh, restoration and ecosystem services. So uh, I think uh, it was a very nice the promotion of this webinar and all the efforts that FAO, FAO is uh, 
uh, handling together with the private sector. And this is very important that uh, our activities uh, goes uh, hand, hand in hand and require then uh, a lot of integration also, but bear in mind that the uh, required integration with the social, cultural and economical frameworks of the regions that uh, these programs will be development. There's a broader framework for identifying national and global restoration priorities uh, for leading regional cooperation efforts, promoted integrated result-based management and forest interventions. And then the economical opportunity attached to the well-functioning ecosystem and uh, the species uh, within it. So uh, just with this brief introduction, uh, it's a call for you, you all to join us in this journey to make a better world with this forest-based products. Uh, that's uh, uh, Jose Carlos, what I had for this uh, introduction. So thank you and thank you all for being with me in this uh, quick presentation. Thank you uh, very much, Francisco. Uh, so everybody now know and understand why we Brazilians are so proud of uh, Clabin and of your work. Very brilliant presentation. Uh, he didn't even go as far as mentioning that uh, uh, Clabin is also uh, top of its class in terms of uh, commitments and engagements in terms of uh, climate change mitigation, uh, abiding by this SBTI, the Science-Based Target Initiative, the Race to Zero Initiative. So, uh, and just to, to give you an idea of size, uh, after seeing the numbers of plantations in, in, in landscape uh, handling by Clabin, in Brazil, our sector uh, currently plants an overall area of 9 million hectares. And, and at the same time, our sector preserves in, in native forest uh, almost 6 million hectares, 5.9 million hectares, which is quite a lot. And this represents barely 1% of the country's territory. So this is, uh, we, and we have lots of areas, of degraded areas to, to, to engage with restoration uh, efforts. So we now, uh, let's move on. Thank you, Francisco, once again. Uh, our next uh, speaker uh, is Mr. Tomo Kumahira, Vice President, Corporate Finance of Strategy, Comanza, Kenya. Uh, Comanza, uh, Kenya. Uh, this is Africa's leading smallholder uh, forestry startup, planting 40% of Kenya's commercial forestry with 25,000 farmers as partners. Uh, manage the company's uh, financial strategy, strategies directly under the CEO, raising around 20 million US dollars Series B with leading investors such as AXA, Investment Managers, Novastar Ventures, FMO, a Dutch DFI, and LDN Fund. Uh, the round was recognized as Impact Investment Project of the Year by Environmental Finance Magazine. 10 plus year track record in delivering social impact through hands-on entrepreneurship, as well as strategic advisory with a mission to make social enterprise scalable and investable. So please, uh, you have the floor, uh, Tomo Kumahira. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for inviting us uh, to this session. We're really honored to present Kumaza today um, in this panel. And uh, as uh, introduction was made already, Kumaza is a social enterprise based in Kenya. And uh, we have been working uh, since 2008 to provide sustainable forestry projects without relying on the conventional plantation style. Um, to accelerate afforestation in the communities while promoting sustainable forestry businesses to create livelihoods and support uh, livelihoods um, in those areas. And uh, we call ourselves often Airbnb of forestry because we do not uh, require land ownership as the basis of operations. We use smallholder farmer forestry model 
uh, which involves a lot of former partnership uh, for uh, afforestation projects. So I'd like to uh, jump into the presentation today uh, with a very quick figure, a quick math that we can think about. The reason why we are here today is because Africa as a whole continent, and of course, Kenya and East Africa, are facing significant wood deficit. As the population is growing uh, and economy is growing faster, uh, we are having a significant pressure from urbanization and land use and that is causing significant wood deficit, which now is taken mostly by the combination of import from other regions and illegal afforestation, so illegal logging. And that's the reason why we are seeing such a high speed of deforestation in the region. While at the same time, it's undeniable, uh, Africa is the only continent that is still growing a population uh, at 2050 when China, India would stop growing its population in the mid 2020s. Uh, we are projecting that $30 billion woods deficit will be reached by 2030. Well, plantation in Africa has been historically difficult because of several reasons. Community relationship, it's always hard to secure large land all the time and manage the expectation with community. Land acquisition, uh, legal structures and governance by law is always a challenge. Long-term financing, um, it's also hard for many financiers to support project over 10 years, which is pretty shorter in forestry terms, while it's pretty long in general investors' timeline. So all in all, it's been very difficult for African continent to scale radically uh, afforestation by conventional commercial forestry. And as I said at the very top, the best time for us to prepare for this $30 billion with deficit by 2030 is either today or even ideally 10 years ago, but we cannot go back to 10 years ago. So we are working really hard now today to help solve this problem. And the solution we are proposing here is smallholder farmers. Smallholder farmers actually are supplying already 30% of Africa's uh, wood supply and which are oftentimes uh, energy, energy source, as well as a smaller diameter uh, logs to support their constructions, uh, instead of a, a industrial wood products that you would imagine, uh, like two by four or plywood. Um, and a as a result, uh, we believe farmers are actually most, mostly available and very powerful solution for large scale forestry issues in Africa. Uh, and we are building a partnership that is mutually beneficial from Kumasa's perspective as a forestry business and farmer as a wood producers. So the, the mutual partnership grows like this. Kumasa and farmers are essentially giving things for free uh, to each other. So Kumasa will provide seedlings, inputs, technical expertise, farmer trainings, all the things that we can uh, supply to them so that we can set farmers tree farming project as success. Well, in return, farmers will provide land, labor, and security for free Again, this is sweat equity, um, but uh, this is all they can provide. And as a result, for Komaza's perspective, we can have uh, a lot of uh, trees planted on the ground in a very timely manner uh, every year uh, with many, many farmers uh, securing long-term wood supply. While from farmer's side, they do not need to contribute any cash upfront. Uh, typically, uh, farmers rely on microfinance or uh, their credit within the villages to access uh, planting resources that, but we don't require any money upfront. So that's also plus for them. And we will uh, offer them um, a fair share of the profit we will generate from uh, our forestry program. So this is a win-win strategy where if farmers fail, then Komaza also fail because we lose the trees and lose the investment. So in this way, we are ensuring a, a good commercial relationship uh, with aligned incentives. And in, in using this ways, we have been planting an, a lot of trees. And last year alone, we planted 1.3 million trees across Kenya uh, with over 5,000 farmers. And this means that um, it's not really a big number if you're from Latin America, but in, in Kenya, this is actually pretty significant uh, because it basically means that we single-handedly planted 40% of Kenya's national uh, commercial uh, afforestation uh, per year. So this is a commercial planting in Kenya every year. We are about 40% share. 
and this uh, is also a, not a negligible number from East Africa or in Africa uh, all over. So we are, are really a uh, strong hope and plan also is to go across Africa using the learning and model that we established over the past decade uh, through uh, trials and errors in coastal Kenya. And the scale itself is not only the benefit of smallholder partnership model, uh, the, the actually the biggest difference between plantation forestry and uh, smallholder forestry is its cost effectiveness. And uh, when you're thinking about uh, asset management uh, as an investor, you typically want to look at the value of land. Uh, in the meantime, in the context of afforestation or carbon sequestration or a smallholder farmer employment, um, it is more important actually to spend less money on the land or something that is already fixed as an asset so that you can plant more trees with the same dollar. And typically plantations require uh, land purchases or leasing or uh, development of roads and other enabling infrastructure while we are only uh, requiring uh, planting for seedlings and a little bit of money to hire the team to do it. So as a result, we are 80% cheaper per hectare of establishment cost, which is making it significantly more valuable uh, for uh, a lot of uh, farmers, a lot of, a lot of forestry investors, especially they're, if they're interested in carbon impact. And I just want to give a quick run through of some photos just to give you a sense of the field as I know everyone is locked down and not really moving around. This is our nursery. This is a typical smallholder farmer uh, that we are working with. From drone picture, you can see uh, the land is pretty available and you see some forestry on the top. This is uh, Komazo's trees. Another example. And we harvest those logs, uh, like this size probably like seven inches to 10 inches poles. And we process them in a factory and we sell as fencing posts. And we do have there are several other product lines, but these are major products that we've been developing right now um, as of today. And the key thing uh, to answer the question, how can we scale this smallholder model and what's been the difference between Kumaza uh, and uh, other typical non nonprofits or NGOs who are working in the more local context uh, with less numbers of farmers is the abil availability of tech. So this is uh, what we use uh, for every one of the over 300 field officers who are supplied with smartphones. And that is how we manage each one of these uh, 25,000 farms that we planted. This is a, a picture from our farmer uh, field officer training. So field officers are typically hired from the villages that we are recruiting farmers so that they can understand their language, uh, including dialogues, dialects, as well as uh, local context as well. Um, and uh, they are trained uh, to use these mobile apps so that they can accurately manage farms process and making sure that data input is accurate. And we are having three major development works. So these applications for the field enrollment, and we have a cloud-based um, platform where we can analyze and manage these large sum of data. And finally, we are also working uh, on several pilots to use AI and machine learning to, to identify uh, opportunities uh, in new, new farmer enrollments. By doing so, we have been attracting significant amount of capital from uh, all top um, industry partners, from uh, nonprofits to uh, institutional investors. And uh, the reason why we have been shifting our uh, narrative uh, for a long time is uh, first phase uh, was pretty much six, seven years as an NGO trying on uh, the model itself uh, by relying mostly on major NGOs and donor financing. Uh, the focus was much more on the social at the very beginning. And uh, we have now becoming, uh, as a venture company uh, in, the, in East Africa, uh, where financial investors also come into us, uh, with, uh, while those investors also appreciate social and environmental impact. And we are now um, looking at ourselves as also an interesting carbon solution um, for uh, Africa and the world. Just to wrap up uh, my section, uh, I would just wanted to give you a quick presentation of why it matters to work with smallholder farmers. This is a map of Kenya. And these are the areas out of the land where it's pretty good for, good for forestry or any agricultural production. Um, and these are the areas where typically plantation would be. Well, you don't really use the rest of the 90%. Um, savanna and semi-arid areas, 
these are not really great for plantation forestry because the growth rate is not that great. But there are many, many farmers who are there. And Komaza is really availing our, ourselves to these regions so that farmers in those areas can actually, without competing against in subsistence, forest, uh, subsistence farming, um, plant trees to make use of the land they thought is not really useful. So these are the core land and we are allowed to go into these orange sections. These are the area that we can, we can add most value because farmers do not really have a lot of good means to uh, work other than um, farming. So if you apply this to Africa, these are the core areas that's already forested or forestry suitable or agricultural suitable in general, but we are missing these, sec these places. That, and this, these are the also areas that we can also work. Um, and that gap is very significant because uh, you have less competition and we have more farmers and we have larger climate impact. Um, so all in all, uh, farmers are the future of African forestry and we're really looking forward to working with every one of you here today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tomo Kumahira. Brilliant presentation. Congratulations on an amazing job. And uh, the question you leave to all of us is how to scale up these uh, incredible experiences and uh, turn uh, smallholder farmers uh, into true uh, ambassadors of best practices around Africa. So this is uh, quite... Uh, quite uh, nice to see. And it, it came to my mind that uh, we could joke uh, by saying that all roads lead to Rome. There are many different uh, ways of uh, contributing to the uh, decade of restoration. And what you're doing in Africa uh, is certainly an amazing way forward. Let's hope this can be replicated around throughout the continent. And uh, I'm sure our audience here uh, is quite uh, impressed by your presentation. Thank you so much. So now let's move on. Our next uh, panelist is Ms. Prada Kupali. She is the Managing Director, Investor Service, New Forest uh, Company, Australia. Prada Kupali leads New Forest Investor Services Business Unit. Her oversight includes integration of responsible investments and ESG innovation into investment strategy and product development, client relations and fund marketing, and research and thought leadership to support new forests as a leading investment manager in the forestry sector. She is a director of the board of new forests, uh, the company itself, member of the company's executive committee and a member of various investments committees. Radha has been with New Forest since 2006. She is also a non-executive director of Timberlink Australia, of Greening Australia. Radha's 20 year career has been focused on driving capital markets towards investing in climate change solutions and sustainable development. Radha has a Bachelor of Arts in International Studies and Economic Theory from American University in Washington, D.C., and an MBA and Master's Degree in Environmental Management from Yale University's School of Management and School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. She is on the advisory board of the Center for Business and Environment, Environment at Yale University and is an associate of the Yale World Fellows Program. You have the floor. Thank you, Jose. And I wish someone had uh, abbreviated that bio <laughs> before you were forced to read all of it. So thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, and it's very nice to be here with all of you um, all around the world. So Francesca, if you could just go to slide three, that would be great. Next slide. Um, so I'll just, as others have done, just give a back one, please. Um, so I'll just give a quick uh, overview of New Forest and then give a little bit of a, a case study um, and then a roadmap of maybe where to from here. Um, so New Forest was founded in 2005, so we'll actually be celebrating our 16th uh, birthday later this year. 
So similar to many of the other organizations um, that we've uh, that I've spoken earlier today, um, so we are an investment manager, uh, a forestry investment manager, and similar to others, um, the philosophy that we've brought to um, land management is that we do want to um, embed uh, conservation, restoration into productive landscapes. So we're ultimately um, investing to create productive and sustainable landscapes to benefit our investment clients, as well as the communities um, where we operate. So this is very much an approach that resonates uh, with um, the way that we do business as well. Next slide. Um, we are a specialist investment manager um, offering strategy um, for institutional clients. So most of our investors are public and private pension funds, uh, sovereign wealth funds, uh, development finance institutions, a very large investor uh, really creating universal portfolio of, of uh, assets um, who are interested in forestry um, for you know, the specific uh, investment characteristics of uh, sustainable timber production. So we have about 6 billion Aussie dollars under management. So it's roughly about 5 billion um, US and about 1 million hectares across Australia, New Zealand Southeast Asia and the US. Um, we are, I think, pretty unique uh, amongst uh, forestry investment managers for having um, a large footprint in the Asia Pacific region. So we have uh, significant pine and eucalyptus plantations um, uh, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, we're a dedicated investment manager for Southeast Asia and currently manage assets across uh, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia and Laos. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later in the presentation and also managing um, assets in the United States. And so we're managing uh, large land areas, about a million hectares uh, worldwide um, of forest plantations, uh, conservation areas, um, and also integrating uh, infrastructure processing and carbon markets uh, as well. And we also have a very strong focus on driving impact um, through our investments and, and innovating in environmental markets. Next slide. So in talking about um, our approach to uh, conservation and restoration, I thought it was important to talk a little bit about how we think about um, uh, managing the landscapes uh, that from in which we invest. And so the framework that we've been using for the last several years is what we call sustainable landscape investment. And it's an integrated approach um, to manage what we think are the material, environmental, social governance issues uh, in forestry investment. So we have about 80 uh, performance indicators across productivity, land use planning, ecosystem services, uh, risk management, shared prosperity uh, with communities and good governance. And so that is really the management framework um, across you know, these environmental social governance issues um, that we bring to bear um, on our portfolio of assets. And so it's a way to us help us um, reduce risk, create value and really support uh, beneficial environmental and social outcomes. So in the context of that um, sustainable landscape investment approach, um, we do engage uh, in land and species conservation programs, um, habitat improvement restoration, um, and species focused research across our global portfolio. Um, so we also have significant um, you know, conservation areas. So across that sort of million hectares that I was referring to, we have about 250,000 hectares um, of conservation areas um, of which there are you know, very significant numbers of um, over 200 threatened or vulnerable plant and animal species on or near the asset. Um, and we have a lot of conservation programs um, in place. But really one of the things that we are focused on and concerned about um, in the context of thinking about the decade on ecosystem restoration is how do we actually build scale um, in the conservation and restoration activities? And ultimately um, that is going to require us to price nature and to create some economic incentives um, for restoration and uh, broader scale conservation activities. And essentially the two mechanisms that you know we're um, uh, trying to uh, push forward are really around two, two areas. So first is carbon pricing um, and uh, where we are actually creating um, an economic incentive for the restoration value, the conservation value um, of the uh, forest ecosystems. And the second thing is how can we actually create innovative investment models um, that embed ecosystem restoration in the investment mandate? 
So we actually have an investment mandate or an economic uh, investment mandate to invest in, in ecosystem restoration. So that's one of the things that I wanted to talk to about next is you know, how, how might we approach that? Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, um, New Forest has been um, as an investor in Asia, um, in Southeast Asia, and we have been operating in Asia for um, about 12 or 13 years now and invested in a first fund across the three countries that I showed to you um, earlier, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Laos. And in starting to raise um, our second investment fund, um, one of the, we reflected on the lessons learned and certainly embedding uh, high quality ESG performance into our assets in Asia um, was a critical factor in uh, the commercial success um, of, uh, of those assets and, and managing those assets. So we asked ourselves, you know, how can we actually do more uh, around um, uh, biodiversity outcomes, community outcomes, climate outcomes in a way that's going to benefit um, the assets uh, that we're managing and align with our investors' incentives. So in raising our new fund, uh, which, is, uh, which is currently in development, we've integrated both a carbon finance element as well as a blended finance element. So this is um, a 300, target $300 million fund, um, and we're bringing together a group of institutional investors, development finance institutions, endowments, corporate investors. And the ultimate, the underlying investment thesis of the fund is to invest in sustainable FSC certified plantation forestry uh, in Asia. So we've introduced a blended finance structure that we co-created with a, a US foundation. And about 10 to 15% of the fund will come from uh, concessional equity. And by blending mainstream institutional capital uh, with concessional equity and slightly changing the cost of capital of the fund, um, we will actually be able to invest in um, kind of beyond BAU, uh, climate, community, and biodiversity uh, impact activities that will be integrated into the portfolio companies uh, into which we invest. So this could include impact activities like uh, environmental plantings, you know, habitat restoration, peatland rewetting, and, and community outgrower schemes. So the, you know, ultimately, depending on the size of the fund, you know, the investment and impact activities could be in the order of, you know, $15 million. And ultimately, what we want to be doing is, you know, going beyond BAU uh, in terms of environmental and social impact and promoting the development of an investable universe of, of asset, forestry assets in Southeast Asia. And the other really, you know, fascinating thing that I think has emerged in the past couple of years is the interest in forestry um, as a climate solution and the continued growth of um, the carbon market in alignment with net zero commitments. So we fully expect as well um, that we'll embed, you know, long-term carbon offtake contracts um, from carbon credit projects that may be developed um, and integrated into the portfolio investments um, of the fund. Next slide. So that's one uh, example of a fund and a potential structure. Um, but as Ludwig talked about at the beginning of this presentation um, and Mete as well, I mean, ultimately we need hundreds of billions of dollars flowing into restoration activities by 2030 to meet our climate and biodiversity targets. And so how do we get there? How do we harness institutional capital um, uh, in, in alignment with this objective? So we've talked to investors extensively um, you know, about this, uh, particularly in the context of, of climate change mitigation. And there's a few key points um, that come out in terms of challenges and opportunities. So the investors who are leading uh, in net zero ambition uh, recognize that nature-based solutions are, are critical to a sustainable future, but they need to better understand the business case and how to allocate capital and resources. They recognize that carbon pricing can transform the investment opportunity in nature but there is still a lack of clarity around pricing, uh, there's regulatory uncertainty, um, and also lack of clarity uh, as standards. And all of those are barriers to investment. You know, investors know that they can use their influence with companies and governments um, to engage and advocate for ending deforestation and uh, implementing stronger climate policies, and also to require transparency and disclosure um, from companies and investment managers um, with respect to emissions and, and nature. So if you think of all of that, then you know, what could potentially be uh, the path forward to get more institutional capital flowing into, into ecosystem restoration? 
So certainly there's more methodological and analytical work uh, that can be done to in embed nature-based solutions into portfolio decarbonization strategies. Uh, we need a critical mass of investors, companies, NGOs, governments um, to coalesce around, coalesce around standards for forestry and land use um, and carbon pricing, and particularly to drive the price of carbon up so that we can get a recognition of the value for biodiversity. So it's not just about carbon, but also the uh, important value of biodiversity. And ultimately, you know, investors and governments can work together to progress the agenda on deforestation-free commodities and integrating uh, financial reporting on natural capital um, and ensuring that nature is you know, on the agenda as we head into COP26 uh, later this year. Next slide. Um, so finally, I was asked to kind of reflect on what this could mean for um, the FAO, and I'm certainly not, not an expert, but some of the things um, that we reflected on is that um, certainly information um, and outlook studies, you know, investors need information and insights uh, to design appropriate investment strategies. So questions that could be asked are, you know, how can investment in plantations and ecosystem restoration be scaled uh, in various countries? You know, what is the country's approach and regulatory framework uh, with respect to carbon markets? So by asking these kinds of questions, we should be able to support developing countries and thinking about and developing, you know, nature-based solutions-led growth um, and encouraging sustainable landscape and community development. And I think the rising interest in natural capital accounting, uh, the emergence of the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, are all opportunities for FAO really to work with countries to promote regulation and disclosure frameworks at the asset and the company level, and to really start mandating that um, as part of uh, doing business um, in, in country. So we know uh, at the high level, you know, what is the huge transformation that we need to see in landscapes? So really now we need to think about the bottom-up strategy. Um, how are we gonna get there? So that's it for me um, and looking forward to the discussion following the presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Radha. Uh, very uh, interesting, very instigating presentation. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, I made some notes uh, in the question and I still go back to the thinking that uh, different roads may lead us to Rome. And uh, you are absolutely right in in pointing out to how to build scale and how to turn this uh, economic uh, pot potential, this uh, attractiveness for institutional investors, uh, something more concrete and more promising and more rewarding. I, I think this is a pretty important, uh, important uh, challenge for all of us. And it gives lots of food for thought for ACSFI. And you are absolutely right in, in mentioning the carbon pricing uh, agenda, which is uh, key. And, uh, and so uh, let's go back to some of these issues when we have the, a few minutes to discuss uh, the panels later on. So let's move on, uh, my friends. Our next speaker is Mr. Martin Berg. Uh, he's the head of Natural Capital Impact Strategy HSBC Pollination Climate Asset Management, UK. Martin has nearly two decades experience in conceptualizing and leading low carbon and other environmental investments in the private and public sector. Currently, Martin is the head of natural capital impact strategy at HSBC Pollination Climate Asset Management, an asset management company dedicated to natural capital. Prior to this role, Martin was a partner at Pollination and part of the team finalizing the joint venture between HSBC Global Asset Management and Pollination. Previously, Martin worked at the European Investment Bank, EIB, based in Luxembourg, where he was the head of the Environmental Funds and Climate Finance Policy Unit. He served on the board of directors for the Green for Growth Fund in Luxembourg and was a vice president at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch in London, responsible for the carbon finance activities of Merrill Lynch. Martin was also a carbon finance specialist at the New York-based environmental investment firm RNK Capital LLC, 
worked at the at the, at the OECD climate change unit in Paris and started his career uh, at the UN uh, CCC, UNFCCC uh, in Bonn. So, uh, Mr. Berg, Martin Berg, you have the floor, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, Jose. And uh, similar to Rata, I wish you would have shown this a little bit, but I'm really pleased to be here. Very difficult to follow. Um, three excellent speakers uh, and, and the, uh, the, the really good introduction by Ludwig earlier today. Um, um, perfect. Before before we're starting, perhaps I can just introduce uh, the, the the company. As you as you as you mentioned, we'll say um, HSBC, HSBC Pollination Climate Asset Management. We are a joint venture between HSBC um, and Pollination. HSBC is probably well known to everybody. Pollination is an advisory and investment firm based in in Australia and the UK and in the US um, with a real clear goal to go towards net zero. So um, it's uh, um, really developing strategies for companies and investment products. And the joint venture with HSBC is one of the first products that came out. Um, we are a very young company. Um, uh, Pollination is, is a little bit older than a year. Um, and uh, in the, the joint venture, which we just abbreviate as CAM, Climate Asset Management, um, is, is, is only been founded uh, in, in September last year. What are we? We are actually building out an asset management firm that is neither uh, focusing on, let's say, just forestry or just agriculture. We're really focusing on, on natural capital. We do believe this is a big trend that nature-related investments will become uh, more prominent and that investors will actually look into these type of investments much more through this lens rather than a traditional, let's say, asset allocation to timber or, or agriculture. Um, and that in, in a way, the new, the new way, the new revenue opportunities that, that Rata just described in regard to biodiversity, but also into um, into carbon, really, maybe the glue that, that combines these. Um, so we are, we are working, um, um, the, the, the two organizations working together on new investment products. I said we are new. We are building out um, uh, our, um, uh, the, the asset management firm, the, the regulatory requirements, and I will talk later a little bit what type of um, ideas we are having. But maybe just to step back, and, and, and it's actually much more to support what Roger what is saying. I think in our view, the, the, the way investors are looking um, at these type of new opportunities is, is, is really changing. From, and, and for us, it's really important. And that's, that's how, to, how we try to communicate is that it's necessary to actually change the narrative. It's no longer just to look at these are forestry investments or these are agriculture investments. It's actually, you have to look at nature and from two sides. From the one hand side, really, as, in, um, um, as, in, as a solution to address climate change, but also as a standalone to really uh, make sure that, that uh, environmental degradation, biodiversity loss is not, not further um, advancing. And that's, uh, that's equally as important. But it also at, at the same time, it really offers an, a new opportunity to have a fresh look at some of the asset classes such as forestry or agriculture, because by looking at from this nature side and from looking at some of the underlying trends, um, it, 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 there are some, some uh, changes happening now. The population growth, that they, one of the key macro trends, we all know this. It's been something that, that uh, they have been discussing uh, also in the FAO for a long time, that there is more, will be more pressure on, on food, which also means there's, that there's an opportunity for investment in this side. But also what we really see is now that, um, that the, the regulatory changes in regard to how nature is being integrated is really about to change. Um, uh, similar to climate, nature is now being looked at in a different way. COVID, I think, has amplified some of the um, the, um, the risks that, that are related to nature and how it actually can also have an impact on financial firms, on portfolios, on supply chains. And I think this is, this is really changing how companies are looking at this. Um, uh, but I mentioned there are um, regulatory new ideas, drivers that are upcoming, such as the task force on nature-related financial dis disclosures. And most importantly, I think it's the consumers that are putting a lot of pressure on, 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 uh, on companies on financial firms that they actually demand now to understand how their products are produced, how their investments, uh, what what actually their investments um, um, entail, and I think that that is really um, on 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 the heart of uh, the, the way we look at this, and, and that really, as I said, provides some new value drivers to to look at more let's say traditional asset classes such as forestry and agriculture in a completely different way. So, what are we trying to 
to do in, um, in, 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 in CAM. So we are, we are having two products there. We're looking at the one hand side, really as natural capital. And I think we're we'll maybe uh, slightly different than what new, I think we share many of the values that, that Vata just described, or we are great admirer of new forest, the way they are pushing it. Probably where we are slightly different is that we're look, looking at it more holistically from the natural capital perspective, and that we're also including the agriculture component as a as a key component from for um, to, to 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 basically address um, um, the need for more nature related uh, investors. And what we're doing is we're looking at from two aspects. On the one hand side, we're we're offering large scale institution investors an, an opportunity to invest into um, into long term projects that provide an impact, a return and the scale, and this is really important. I think the move to scale is really something that that is is, is absolutely required um, in, in in order to be to be successful to to address the climate and also now the, the nature problem that, that we're having. And this is really what we're trying to put in a very large scale product that allows an institutional investor um, in insurance companies to invest large sums in in, in the strategy that um, that really also has the approach to to um, to change landscapes, and, and that's really at the heart of our natural capital strategy. That we're actually only going into projects if we um, if we can quantify that we're leaving the project or the land that uh, that we are um, working with in in a better place than we, we found it. Um, but by putting this into an um, into an uh, into an um, in, in economic or profit seeking strategy, we also see that it actually works in that sense that by putting more impact or by focusing more on impact and having allowing for a longer time frame, it is really possible also to actually have more sustainable on long term returns. And the interesting part for the, what we're seeing on the investors is really that the the ability to have also um, carbon credits or new opportunities in biodiversity is really something that makes this product interesting and different to what they have invested before in, and this is really how we try to position it. At the same time, we're also focusing on, on, on a carbon solution, which is really um, um, allowing companies that have net zero targets and that would like to acquire carbon credits that they can actually do that. Now, what I wanted to talk about a bit as a, as a case study is really um, to go really beyond carbon, because I think that's one of the, the, the key um, issues we're seeing at the, at, uh, at the moment when we're talking about um, how ecosystems can, can be restored or, or how we actually can um, talk about natural capital with, with, um, with investors. The, um, carbon returns are very well understood, but actually trying to now go to the next step and really finance ecosystem restoration, this is obviously still a challenge. Um, because, um, it's, and it's been mentioned before from, from the speakers, that the, one can buy land and can restore it, but then what is actually the, the um, what are the revenue drivers for that in order to do that? And, and we can only, in our view at least, um, advance this if we are developing more um, projects and mechanisms that, that allow actually to, um, um, to, to invest in these type of projects and, and, and seek a return. What I wanted to talk about is maybe in, in um, an opportunity not less in, in, in a developed country in the UK. Um, so we are, we're seeing an interesting um, opportunities in, in ecosystem restorations related to biodiversity. And the one concept we, 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 we hope will be really promising is the so-called net gain offset um, um, mechanism that the UK government is, uh, is developing, which allows to, um, or which, which requires someone who would like to have a, a, to do an economic activity such as a project or a power plant or a shopping mall on a piece of land where biodiversity is destroyed that actually it has to be ensured that more biodiversity is restored on an adjacent or related site. And this really drives a lot of new ideas how actually um, biodiversity or the increase of biodiversity can, can be financed because it really um, creates a revenue driver because the companies that that, that want to do this economic activity have to then basically um, make sure that the that the net gain biodiversity activity has been um, uh, has been taking place and um, the the um, potential for for these type of projects is is, to, is restoring wetlands and habitats and biodiversity um, has a big potential for for forest and soil um, uh, sequestration in the UK in particular there's a big big, big um, flooding component in there. Um, because by by actually doing it in the right way, it also reduces the risk of flooding. And, and, and interesting enough, many of these projects are actually in, in areas where, where flooding is a 
um, uh, is a is a big um, um, a big issue. Um, and then said so, uh, the underlying in order to finance these projects, what needs to be done is normally an, an uh, project um, developer would buy the land and structure um, a net gain transaction um, the, um, that is that is linked to a new development and would get paid for that to actually restore or increase the biodiversity on on uh, on, on that area, and that would then be paid through an. Um, uh, a corporate offset arrangement, um, and in the, the UK has a woodland um, uh, carbon code where also it's possible to also get some additional carbon credits. So it can be a combination out of biodiversity offsets and, and, and carbon credits. So from I wanted to present this here because we believe this is this is an, a neat example how um, and maybe also as a recommendation for FAO how actually um, opportunities can be created in related to biodiversity, which is real in in our view one of the the missing links. Um, and um, the, uh, and and maybe um, this this could be actually transformed into 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 other areas. And uh, and I think the the biggest issue at the moment we are seeing is that even in the UK, those projects are relatively small. Uh, so um, th there has to be some aggregation um, while well, aggregation is required. And the pricing signals are probably more still on the voluntary on the speculative side. So and 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 obviously with more regulation or more pressure that uh, that then actually more voluntary voluntary action in, is happening would, would would be very welcome but um i leave it here maybe this is some food for thought for the discussion thank you very much thank you very much uh, martin a brilliant presentation uh, your call to action is that we need to change the narrative and nature is a part of the solution to address climate change it's a uh, sharply to the point and uh, we have to a lot uh, lots of work to to go on with that so uh, wow it's been an amazing uh, series of uh, panels very impressive all the presentations but now we will breathe a little bit uh, and have some time, not a lot of time though, uh, for uh, discussion. Uh, we have many, many questions in the, on the chat. Uh, the audience is really following closely. I would say this is a blockbuster almost. And uh, with the help of Lindo, we have uh, uh, tried to organize some of the questions. And uh, so we we'll have a few minutes now to do it. So I would uh, ask from all those uh, replying uh, to be very brief because time is very short, unfortunately. So, uh, good question. For instance, to to get started, uh, for Francisco, uh, uh, can you specify a bit, uh, Francisco, what it means that forty percent of forests are preserved? Do they have an official protection status, or is this part of the law? to protect some force on a concession, or is this a voluntary commitment? If so, how long-term is the commitment? Francisco Hazolini, please. Thank you, José Carlos. Thank you for uh, the question. It's a good question. Well, there is a, a regulatory mandatory uh, protected areas in, uh, in Brazil due to, uh, to the, our forest code and environmental uh, laws. So uh, this is uh, about uh, 20% of, uh, of, of our area. So on top of that, uh, these are voluntary uh, uh, preserved areas. And uh, the term will be long uh, because we are not touching that area any longer. Today in Brazil for cutting uh, the native uh, areas in, in our area of operation requires a huge compensation. That's 10 times the areas you cut usually. So that area will be there forever. Okay, thank you, Francisco. Now a question. Uh, posted on the chat to, to Tomo. Uh, person says, a great presentation, but not clear to me what the re restoration benefits are in terms of ecosystem services and biodiversity. This looks like a classical outgrower scheme, uh, like, uh, for instance, existed in many years in South Africa for eucalyptus. What is the restoration benefit? It's important not to equate afforestation with ecosystem restoration, because they are not the same. What would be your comments, uh, Tomo? Yeah, thank you very much. This is actually a very important point that uh, I could not really fully explain in the short presentation, but it's exactly right. The afforestation does not uh, directly mean that um, 
there's a landscape restorations and the, the way we approach this approach, uh, this issue is several. So first we will, uh, our, our, our planting will be taking place in areas that are not used. So typically a bush or maybe like it's just abandoned land. And in semi-arid dry lands, it's pretty common for farmers not to really make use of all the land that they have. And that's where uh, it's not used for agricultural production. It's not really used for anything. And originally those areas are actually forests. So uh, if you look at the pictures uh, 50, uh, you know, 50 years ago or 30 years ago, those places had much more trees than uh, what it is today. So it's a uh, first, first note is that it's uh, the, where we are operating in the landscape itself is a result of deforestation already. And what we are doing is uh, finding out where things are not happening at all in terms of subsistence farming. We plant trees that will allow soil um, recovery, especially on the moisture side. And we often promote uh, intercropping. That's also make a, a in, uh, interesting agricultural uh, impact. And finally, uh, promoting sustainable forestry practice in the area is really critical because the alternative for farmers to, to get uh, firewood or any wood products is now mangroves. So as you may know, mangroves has much higher um, environmental impact per hectare. Um, so in order for us to interfere, it's not enough to just plant trees, but also really continue to replace um, the, uh, the wrong market structure that's happening in the area. So, so that's how we approach uh, this issue of restoration um, instead of just planting trees and be happy with it. Thank you, Tomo. Uh, now a question to Rada. Uh, how can we further bring more transparency in Southeast Asia forest industries? Any recent call to action or guidelines for that region? I, the person says, I don't know who could answer this question, but rather perhaps could. Uh, so we might take this on notice and back, get back to them. And uh, this would be uh, the question rather for, for you at this moment. Yeah, I mean, I guess there has been a history of, you know, unsustainable native forest logging <clears throat> by some of the large pulp and paper companies um, in Southeast Asia. So um, I think there has been a big push to um, by NGOs in the area, uh, in the region to engage with these companies. Um, ultimately, we think third party certification, uh, FSC certification is hugely beneficial uh, to ensuring that um, uh, we are respecting local communities, uh, removing any risk of deforestation, um, having a much more uh, a verified and transparent process. And so from, from our perspective, that has to be the um, foundation uh, for uh, operation in Southeast Asia. Um, and I think that's ultimately uh, where um, uh, one of the ways uns unsustainable practices need to be um, uh, need to be squashed out. So maybe I'll just leave it there in the interest of time, but happy to to have a further discussion with whoever asked that question. Thank you, Radha. Uh, now a question for Martin. Uh, reflecting on your early comments uh, regarding the potential for a working group on the new force based on new force based industries on sustainable finance and ecosystem restoration and restoration friendly forest products. What are your thoughts? Any insights about how that might have an impact? So was this a question to me, Jose? Uh, what, uh, what sort of impact that would have if we uh, go, go on your thought regarding a, a working group, group on new forest based industries uh, for sustainable finance or ecosystem restoration? Yeah, but look, uh, I, I think more. I, I, I'm not sure I suggested that, but I, I'm happy to have to, to to give my my thought on this. I think generally speaking, to have uh, more more discussion cooperation would be good. I think my recommendation would be if you want to have a task force like this, then, then some of the key industry players should be on the table as well. So I think it's really important to to have to have to to have um, um, all the relevant stakeholders there to. Um, to, to, to really allow to have the, the input also from the, um, from the private sector. Thank you for being brief, Martin. Uh, this is one for Rada and for yourself. Uh, how do you go about identifying large projects that deliver <coughs> financial returns and also environmental and social impacts? How is the pipeline built? Uh, that's 
seems to be the real constraint. What advice would you have? Would you guys have? I mean, <clears throat> we have um, uh, investment teams. Um, we're very local, so operating in all the regions that where we are, um, are investing. Um, and uh, so ultimately, that's how we are spending time building relationships, understanding what the investment opportunities are. So we undertake a rigorous you know, due diligence process um, and uh, understanding the um, environmental and social risks as well as the uh, opportunities are embedded into our um, <clears throat> investment program. Um, and so we're assessing all of that as we engage in due diligence um, and uh, ultimately it becomes part of our strategic management going forward But you're certainly right, you know, um, uh, developed versus developing countries, there's different issues with um, finding assets, but particularly finding investable assets and or where you can manage the risk uh, in, in places like uh, uh, in like in Asia or other emerging markets elsewhere is a critical part of the challenge, um, particularly getting institutional investors uh, engaged. Yeah, I would, I would fully agree that obviously the scale is, is, is a challenge in uh, in, in, in in general, in, in, in this type of investments. Um, the very similar approach to what Bata just described. We are, we are building out a point system. So we're actually scoring each project and in an ex ante approach to then see how this actually ranks in regard to impact. Uh, and there's a return um, composition in that as well. And then to, to really see that uh, that we have an ability to to increase that score over time. So that's, that's very important to, to have the impact piece incorporated. Obviously, the um, the return also has to be right. That is, that is a challenge. Um, with our first strategy, we're focusing mostly on developed markets, so that is a little bit easier, but even there, um, aggregation is necessary. The, the project I showed in, in the UK, when you, when you look at these type of opportunities there, there's a lot of aggregation um, necessary. So the way we are working or with, with, with um, um, the, well, the approach we're taking is to work with partners that help us aggregating this and, and really starting small and then finding ways to, to, to increase those partnerships to get sizable investments because that's, as Rat has saying, that's, that's a key obstacle at the moment for large institutional investors that the investments are scalable. So for us, there has to be, the, the impact piece has to be right, but there also has to be <clears throat> towards scalability over time, but it probably needs to Thank you, Radha and Martin. Uh, now a question for Tom. Tomo, uh, how to scale forest plantation up on drier areas with no uh, forest ecosystem on the basin and uh, to have an impact if we consider that this activity competes for scarce water resources in those regions? Tomo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another great uh, question on, on the sustainable forestry in rural Kenya or East Africa. Um, just to be clear, I think uh, what we are trying to do right now is still uh, planting uh, trees in areas that has minimum rainfalls enough to sustain trees. So that's a very basic. So we cannot really plant trees in desert because it's just very hard. And in those areas, we should not use the water as the, the questioner, uh, the questioner really addressed um, for uh, planting trees. They should use it for livelihoods. So um, that being said, um, that areas that we have been approaching at the very beginning was actually one of the driest areas in the country already in Kenya, um, where droughts are pretty frequent and the rainfalls are minimum. Um, so as a result, we are already forced to plant in areas that are kind of at the boundary of uh, areas we should plant trees or not plant trees at all. And uh, the, the biggest learning from us is from our side uh, over the past decade is actually utilize everything you have access to. So uh, for example, we plant over a million trees, but across three to four weeks period. Um, so it's a very big operations and it's really hard. But the reason why we're doing it and not constantly enrolling farmers is because we are hitting our operation with um, the rain season. So we have one month of rain, rain season in, in, um, in April, May. And that's the, that's the time we plant trees so that we can maximize some, uh, the rainfalls um, as a source of water when the seedlings needs most water to settle down. Um, and uh, we also use um, other techniques to, uh, for example, growing uh, seedlings to certain size before we plant trees is also another very important uh, ways to increase the resilience of seedlings um, before uh, being grounded so that uh, the minimum water is needed after planting. 
Um, so there are uh, several layers of uh, these small hacks or techniques that are pretty common practice in forestry, but must be really carefully integrated into the operations so that we can minimize the use of water and adapt to the most severe environment for trees. Thank you so much, Tomo. We are very much uh, at the end of, uh, of our time for this moment of uh, Quill and A in discussion. We have many other questions. I'll ask our friends at the ACF team to, to organize them and send them over to all of our panelists so they can uh, later on uh, reply directly to those interested. Uh, so continuing with our program, I would now uh, invite Mr. Christophe Bezassier, who is the Forestry Officer, Forest and Landscape Restoration Mechanism at FAO. Christophe is a Forestry Officer and currently coordinating the Forest and Landscape Restoration Mechanism, FLRM at FAO where he is providing technical assistance in implementing restoration projects in more than 20 countries. He mobilized resources to scale up restoration, reaching a 40 million US dollar portfolio with multiple key financial partners. He is involved in major international restoration initiatives such as the Bonn Challenge, the GPL, GPLFR, GPFLR, in the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. From 2009 to 2014, he was in charge of, of Silva Mediterranean. And from 2000 to 2009, he worked as regional advisor for the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Sahel and the Congo Basin regions. Christophe, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, Christoph. Yes, yeah. yes. Thank you. Okay. Yes. So, uh, briefly, uh, I have been asked to provide a, a, a brief update and uh, to try to link what was presented by the panelists with several initiatives in the context of, of the UN decade, in particular, uh, the activities done and led by FAO uh, in the context of two task forces. Can you see my screen or not? Yes, we can. Yes, yeah. we can. Perfect. So uh, I will present to you briefly uh, the activity of the two task forces. One is on monitoring uh, and one is on good practices. And I think that based on what was presented today, we have potential synergy to develop uh, with the activity of those task forces. Can you, uh, for, for the task force on uh, monitoring, I am talking on behalf of my uh, colleague, Julian Fox, who is leading this task force. The priority of, uh, priorities of this uh, monitoring task force is to establish a framework for ecosystem restoration monitoring, the firm, uh, is to propose technical solutions uh, with training material for monitoring uh, several indicators, both biophysical and of course also socioeconomic indicators, uh, and to, the, to, to prepare uh, country pilots and case studies on monitoring to disseminate geospatial uh, data and uh, building on the existing uh, uh, platforms. Christoph, can you put your presentation on mode? It's, uh, we cannot see it, it's only the first slide. Okay, sorry for that. Allora, I have to share this. Is it better now? Yes, we see it at least. Yes. Okay. Then uh, this uh, this uh, oh, sorry because I cannot see that. Uh, this task force is will launch the, the 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 framework for the launch of the UN decade uh, to be held on uh, early June twenty. 21 uh, and the firm geospatial platform will be presented as a beta version and there is uh, some uh, workshop to be organized next week on technology and innovation for restoration monitoring um, there is a, a strong interest from my perspective uh, 
to have the private sector uh, engage and uh, in, in, in this monitoring task force, uh, assuming that it seems that you have a lot of uh, interesting data, particularly uh, socioeconomic data on both on cost and benefits of ecosystem restoration in the initiatives you are leading and uh, it could be uh, very useful uh, to have you on board and to use the tools proposed and to test the tools proposed uh, in the context of your project. Uh, we have also a task force on best practices uh, led by our team uh, with a lot of organizations and uh, in this context uh, we are mainly uh, working on uh, uh, several outputs with some uh, uh, activities that are ongoing. Uh, the launch of the global survey uh, on, on capacity for restoration. Uh, I really think that the committee, advisory committee on sustainable forest industry and uh, uh, its uh, multiple members uh, could be uh, uh, an interesting target uh, audience for this survey. We would like to have you on board and to have your answer to analyze the needs and the capacity uh, development needs, uh, particularly from you, your perspective as a private uh, partners. We are also working on the principle for ecosystem restoration. Uh, we are preparing a document on key principles and criteria that will uh, allow us to define and qualify uh, more in, uh, what is really ecosystem restoration uh, and how to qualify a, a good practice. I think it's important based on the discussion we had now just before my presentation, it seems that uh, uh, we we have some activities that are some uh, classic uh, plantation uh, afforestation activities. Uh, what can be make, will make a difference and how to qualify ecosystem restoration, how to consider the environmental benefits in in uh, in, in the project the private sector is implementing. Uh, it could be very useful uh, for you maybe to uh, use and, and, and be on board of this uh, activity and, uh, and this task force to, uh, to, and to apply the principles and criteria we will promote in the context of the decade. And finally, one activity that is ongoing in our uh, task force is uh, uh, the collection of good practices. And of course, uh, based on uh, the uh, multiple examples you have in, uh, in the advisory committee on sustainable food industry, forestry industry, and, and uh, based on uh, the, the field actions you have, it could be very useful for us uh, to have a, a, a commitment and a, an engagement of the private sector in the provision of good practices uh, in, the, in the context of this UN decade. Uh, again, I would like to uh, push you as a partners, members of the Advisory Committee on Sustainable Forest Industry to take the survey we have developed on, uh, uh, in the context of the Task Force on Best Practices uh, to allow us to have a better understanding on the capacity needs uh, from the private sectors and from your partners in, uh, in the different uh, country where, we are, where you are working. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Christophe. Uh, very clarifying presentation. Uh, very important uh, uh, alert. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. And uh, so thank you so much. Uh, so in order to save up time, let's move on uh, swiftly uh, to our next and final uh, speaker. Mr. Tim Christofferson is the head of Nature for Climate branch at the UNEP, UNEP, and he is an experienced leader in transformational change agent for sustainable development with a demonstrated history of working in international policy arena, public private partnership, fundraising, and team building. Strong vision and technical base in natural resources management, biodiversity, land restoration, and climate change. Chair of a global partnership of 30 plus leading organizations, including World Bank, UN governments, 
in private sector. Um, Tim, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much. And also thank you to FAO for organizing this seminar and for inviting me. Together with Mette Wilkie and FAO and Eduardo Mansour, I'm the focal point in UNEP for the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which is co-led by our two agencies. It um, was very interesting to listen to all the presenters and um, reflect on what we've heard and how the forest industry can contribute to the goals of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which are the same goals as the Rio Conventions and the SDGs. We, um, first of all, should be very clear about the fact that ecosystem restoration is not necessarily the same as business as usual forestry or afforestation. In fact, as we all know, forestry can lead to further degradation as can afforestation um, of uh, lands in particular, if they are grasslands or other areas of uh, natural habitat. So it is important that we ask ourselves, and I heard a few things about that on this webinar, what is the additionality of coming into this field with new investments? And here it's um, good to note, building on what Christoph said with the best practices task force, that there is work ongoing to clarify and set a norm and a threshold for the key performance indicators, but also for the environmental and social safeguards and for the monitoring of the benefits of forest activities for restoration. There is the task force of nature related financial disclosure that Martin mentioned. There is the EU taxonomy of what constitutes a green investment, which will influence the money flowing into this field. But there's also more of a what I would call soft work. For example, at UNEP, we're working on a number of key performance indicators for a new restoration seed capital facility that can incentivize the establishment of new private sector investment funds in forest and landscape restoration. We're also aiming to bring down monitoring costs again, which uh, will be relevant to probably all the speakers and future investors in this space because with more uh, strict KPIs and a clear need to demonstrate social and environmental benefits of investments comes a requirement of monitoring and a related cost. So bringing down those costs by um, employing new technology, standardizing what we need to monitor is also a key challenge for the sector. The third point I took with me was the um, importance of creating win-wins. Um, and here I would like to mention one thing that I didn't hear on the seminar, but um, that will hopefully become an area of investment. And that is investing in the diversity of commercially used tree species, both in agroforestry and in timber. Because at the moment, as you're all aware, the global um, timber market is dominated by quite by very few species, especially at the high end of the spectrum. And there are many more species where with some research and development, a commercial market could be developed and that would take pressure away from some of the few um, remaining pockets of high value timber species. So looking into biodiversity for commercial um, plantations is one thing that I didn't hear, but maybe uh, also a future area of investment. One area that did come up, um, especially in the two presentations about um, the invested investing landscape is the importance to bridge the link between forestry and food production so that we come out of this dichotomy of seeing them as contradictions and move to a possible option where forests are seen as a positive contribution to the environmental capacity of a landscape to produce food, or in some cases, even uh, increase food production through agroforestry, through nitrogen fixing trees, and other techniques um, that work mostly in the tropics, but also in other areas. What um, 
I would like to stress, having heard from the speakers, is that this field is attracting a lot of attention. And we've heard some of that on this call, but there's a lot more coming in the next months and years. New investment funds, uh, a resurging carbon market, um, a lot of interest in ecosystem services as a marketplace. So we are seeing the emergence of a multi-billion dollar annual market for investments in nature. And forests will be a main player of those investments. What we don't see yet, though, is the um, army of, of ecopreneurs that we need to actually design and um, structure projects and projects that are not only small scale, but that can be brought to large scale. So we need to invest collectively or perhaps also with public funds in the project pipeline and the pre-creation, the, the creation of larger scale restoration projects. And again, the restoration seed capital facility we launched a few months ago can help, but there are other public funds um, that can support this kind of project development. Finally, as we move towards the public launch of the UN Decade on the 5th of June 2021, together with World Environment Day, I encourage um, all of you on this webinar and all the speakers and panelists to start to um, see the activities that you're doing that are additional to business as usual in the context of the UN Decade. And join uh, the growing movement under generation restoration there are opportunities for participation at this moment restricted to the uh, for non-commercial use but we're working on a private sector engagement strategy the last point i would like to make is that with cop 26 in the uk coming up and the um, the negotiations on article 6 and the carbon market there is also a good opportunity to send a clear market signal for a stable and growing carbon market as one pers one possible uh, option for revenue streams in the overall diversified portfolio of incomes from forestry investments. And um, we are going to launch there a green gigaton challenge to scale up forest-based carbon um, to one gigaton per year by 2025. So this again is an opportunity that is coming up, but the forest sector and the forest-based industry just need to be ready, not only to deliver uh, on uh, those opportunities, but to, to also clearly see that this is not business as usual. What we're looking for is, is clearly um, additional benefits in terms of biodiversity, of social benefits, of ecosystem services from the forests that are managed or the forest landscapes that are restored. With that, back over to you. And thank you once again to FAO for organizing this very timely webinar. Thank you, Tim. Uh, very important remarks, uh, closing a two hour marathon of uh, very interesting and, and, and provoking presentations and discussions. Uh, we would need many more hours to continue and deepen some of aspects of this discussion, but some of the points you raised are, are quite, uh, I like this expression of equipreneurs. Uh, this is what we need, uh, the, 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 the strength to, to be innovative, to be creative, to think out of the box. This is very important and to consider that uh, we, we need to, to pay attention to this connection or to this uh, false dilemma between uh, food production and forestry. You're absolutely right. And we have uh, our hands full of uh, challenges uh, in the years to come uh, as we face this ter ter terrible pandemic, this uh, unprecedented uh, crisis in all aspects, a dramatic uh, turn in event of events that has somehow lots to do with climate change in, in many ways, in more ways than we can perhaps think of today. So it is my, my honor to uh, close this uh, webinar and to thank, uh, and, and I, I'm sure Sven and Linda will uh, recognize we, we did a, 
<laughs> an effort to keep tab of the time here. We are about uh, closing at the right moment. And thank so much uh, the ACSFI team for arranging it, for organizing it, uh, for uh, inviting such a, a wonderful lineup of, uh, of speakers. And let's hope this is just the beginning of uh, many other opportunities for us to discuss and to debate and to study and to, and to network on, on such an important, uh, such important agenda. Uh, as we can see, the private sector all over the world and the society in general uh, have uh, lots to contribute to this discussion, to these actions, and to the, the way we move forward with our planet in these turbulent times of challenges, but also of uh, huge opportunities. So keeping sharply the time allotted to us, I thank you all and uh, look forward to keeping this conversation going on. The presentations will be shared to everybody, will be uh, posted at the ACF, ACSFI uh, web page, and the questions that were not uh, answered to will also be addressed uh, in due time by, by our, our friends and presenters. So thank you so much. Have a great day from Brazil. Goodbye to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Ciao, ciao.